So the supplements recommended for vegans, of course, DHA, EPA, and we get that from a non-fish source, from an it's algae grown in the laboratory, and there's only one company in the United States that makes all the vegan EPA and DHA, so all the different brands you could buy with all the different labels are all made by the same company. They're just marketed by different labels. And I also sell DHA on my website. And I originally started doing that and started selling supplements because I felt an imperative necessity to do this because I had so many people I were caring for. And when I was trying to give them what was available in the marketplace, I had so many complaints about burping and indigestion due to the supplements that were rotten. And we'd test the supplements, we'd send them to labs to evaluate them, and they would have a high TBA score, they had a high degree of rancidity. And I really felt an obligation and a responsibility to my patients and my own family and friends to have a better quality product. So I, would, I worked over the years with the company to make DHA to see how we could get it to be fresh and not turn rancid from being sitting in a shelf. And the only way that worked it for us the best was not adding preservatives to it. It was if you saw that the rancidity increased the more it sat on the shelf after it was fabricated. So we would have them ship it to a packet in dark glass to keep it so light wouldn't affect it. And then we'd have it shipped to us in refrigerated trucks in the time of manufacturing. And when it would arrive in our facility, we'd keep it in big refrigerators at a certain temperature. So when the person orders it, it goes to them so they're getting a fresh degree of EPA, DHA, not some rotten oil. And we didn't pack it into a, into a capsule. We kept it into a dropper because when you put it in a capsule, you're swallowing something you're not tasting. And then you're starting to eat something that could be rotten without actually tasting it. And the fact that we felt when it starts to taste a little funny, then you have rancidity there. So you should actually be tasting it to make sure it tastes clean and fresh. And if you're not using a brand that's refrigerated, and I think mine's the only one, but you never know, a person could take bottles from the, you know. Then you should take the capsules and cut them open with a serrated knife and squeeze them out into your spoon and taste it, even if using fish oil, because fish oil goes rancid too. You shouldn't be putting it in your mouth if it has a funny taste. We'll talk about B12, we did zinc already. Iodine is present in plants, including seafood and, uh, and kelp, but we're, we're, most people are getting their iodine from salt, and we're certainly not recommending you do that. So it's wise to probably have a source of iodine in your diet regularly, but not too much. Vitamin D, you understand, too little can be not good and too much can be not good. And the sweet spot for the ideal level of vitamin D is probably between 30 and 50 on the blood. You have a level of 26, 27, and you're already taking a vitamin D in your supplement, it's probably good enough. Don't go crazy. If you're taking 2,000 and your level comes out to be 26 or 27, it's good enough. You don't have to take more. Every 1,000 you take knocks up your level about 10 points. So if you're at 25, you want to get to 35, you take 1,000 more usually. But most people taking about 2,000 of vitamin D, if their levels aren't adequate, it's usually they're t not taking the, the supplement with some fat. If you're eating it with a meal that you had some nuts, because vitamin D is a fat-soluble substance and you need to be absorbed along with taking some fat in your diet. So usually people want to get a little higher. We don't even increase the dose. We just tell them, take it with your meal that has the nuts in it so you don't take it you know, on, on an empty stomach to make sure you're absorbing it better. Now, we don't want people to take 5,000 or 10,000 vitamin D and push their levels up to be 50, 60, 70, or 80. That's risky. We just want you to take enough to make sure you're getting in the normal range. And we don't want your level to be too low either. And, we don't want, and lying out in the sun or getting an extra, lot of, extra amount of sun to get your vitamin D might be okay, but the sun you know, could wrinkle your skin and cause skin cancer. And we also don't live, in, live indoors and we work indoors. And it's kind of like hard to assure you get enough vitamin D from the sun. It's much, I think it's better to get moderate amounts of sun and take a moderate amount of vitamin D. It's more conservatively sensible. At, there was a study on Hawaiian surfers who spent hours out in the sun every day in the surf, you know, and they took their vitamin D levels when they, um, and they found out that 80% of them were vitamin D deficient in spite of spending a lot of the day out in the sun. And they discovered the reason why they, were, they thought they were deficient. These were Caucasian surfers. The lighter skinned people absorb vitamin D easier. Darker your skin, the more vitamin D uh, sun exposure you need. 
And they found it because after they get off the surf, they'd come into the public showers and use soap and, and wash their skin with soap. And the oils on your skin, when vitamin D is made in the skin, it takes a few hours for the oils to soak through. And when you soap yourself and take a shower when you're exposed, you're washing the vitamin D away and you don't get the benefit of the sun. And I'm just explaining that because that's why I only take a shower once a month, whether I need it or not. And now I'm looking for a scientific reason why I could tell my wife it's okay to leave the toilet seat up. So where's iodine? Iodine has that narrow window of excellence between like 100 and 200 micrograms a day. Both too much and too little can decrease thyroid function. You take a lot of iodine and your thyroid is going to shut down. You take too little and you can't produce enough thyroid hormone. So both too much and too little are dangerous. And there's so many people on the internet, these alternative doctors and people selling you things, blue gold solution. Some people think it's good to take huge amounts of iodine. And I'm saying, you gotta be really be careful with that. There's, you know, we don't have long-term studies showing the safety of taking huge amounts and mega dosing of these supplements. You're better off taking a little bit. Too much iodine supplementation has been shown to increase risk of thyroid cancer. You know, you want, so the right amount to take is 150 micrograms a day is the RDI. In this case, the RDI is correct. The government's level is about right. You want to be in that window. The supplement I make does have 150. And, if, and the problem with using kelp all the time for iodine is the problem is you could take too much because kelp has 150 micrograms per one-tenth teaspoon. So the, when you're using kelp as a seasoning, Certainly you could do that so you don't need to take a supplement of iodine, but you want to make sure you don't overdose with iodine. And there are some areas of Japan where they, you get eat seaweeds and, and kelp and things like that where they're, where they're actually overdosed with iodine. It's a problem because you're getting too much iodine. But mostly in this country, obviously we're not using seaweed a lot. I'm not using seaweed regularly. You get too much salt from it usually, so I'm, put, I'm taking regular iodine. Vitamin D, of course, Cochrane analysis showed that vitamin D3 supplementations has had a 12% lower risk of all cancer deaths from people taking it. There's some benefits there with immune function to have normal levels, but that doesn't mean you push yourself to people who are the vitamin D advocates and vitamin D supplement groups who want to push your level above 50. I'm saying just to take enough to be in the normal range or bottom part of the normal range is good enough. Having a level between 30 and 40 or 25 to 40 is good enough. Don't think you've got to take huge amounts. 1,000 to 2,000 a day is plenty. It's rare that a person needs more than 2,000 a day, but if you're taking 2,000 a day and your blood test is 15 or 8 below 20, you should definitely take more. Take 3,000. Try to take 1,000 more. The problem with the vitamin D supplementation is you go to a doctor and he does your vitamin D level and he shows your level is super low and he gives you 50,000 units of vitamin D to take as a supplement, or as a, right? And that totally messes you up now because you're taking 50,000 usually of D2, which is a synthetic vitamin D that could have harm, more harmful effects than D3. He's giving you the wrong type of vitamin D. But also, now your levels are good on your blood for a long time, and you never know what to take, how much is good for you to take long term. It's better not to, to mush, push you up in one dose to normal. It's better to adjust you just by increasing it by 1,000, so then with time you can see, well, what's the right level for me to be taking for the rest of, you know, for long term? Not to push you up real high and then have you drop down too low again and then push you up real high again. That's just not the way, right way to do things, to overdose things. K2. K2 was not found in food, mostly found in fermented foods and animal products, cheeses. Um, we get plenty of vitamin K, and there's some bacteria action of turning K1 into K2. We do have some exposure to K2, but K2 has been shown to be so protective against calcifications in the heart and, and bone disease and osteoporosis that it seems that on a plant-based diet, it's wise to supplement with little K2 because we have such great studies showing how protective it is. Look, it reduces vertebral, fra vertebral fractures by 60%, hip fractures by 77%, especially for women taking a little extra K2 to facilitate the absorption of calcium, to keep the calcium in the bones, not to have calcium go into the muscle tissues of the heart. K2 really keeps the calcium and prevents the body from developing calcifications where you shouldn't have calcifications. How much K2? I recommend about 50 50 micrograms a day, and my, and my multi that I make, I make, a, I make three basic multis of prenatal that has a little bit of iron in it for people who are around, pre, you know, who need iron, women who are menstruating or childbearing years, years, but I'm making it clear I don't recommend all women take the one with iron in it. 
That should be determined by the blood test, by a ferritin level. Because like a lot of women of childbearing age don't need iron, even when they're pregnant. And then I make a men's multi and a women's multi that has the, right, the level that I recommend for K2, iodine, vitamin D, zinc, B12, the things I... And so I'm making a multivitamin geared for people on a relatively healthy diet, not trying to take things, they put things they don't need or give them high, too high doses. You go to an analysis of vitamins on the internet, it'll say, well, this is a better vitamin because it has so much of a high dose of all these things. And I'm saying, I don't want a high dose of all these things. Also, when you make a vitamin... I have the opportunity to choose with the manufacturers what's the source of vitamin D, what's the source of the K2, what's the source of the... Uh, full, and there's like 10 different grades you can buy of, ch of cheapness or more expensive of almost anything, including a mushroom extract or a pomegranate extract or a turmeric extract. There's all different prices and different grades. You could put the same thing on the label from a cheaper, more inexpensive grade, but since so I'm making it my you know, mission, Hit that niche. My niche is not to water down my, like a name like other doctors or, or nutritional gurus that are just want to like appeal to everybody and just like, you know, kind of like water down the information so people aren't, they don't offend anybody. But I want to do what's ideal for people, right? So I'm going to keep that niche. So, I'm gonna, so my supplement's going to have the most expensive form of that substance that's, you know, not the cheapest form. And so obviously I'm just trying to make a better quality product so to give people the best kind of best options. Now we'll just go into the studies on DHA for a minute to review this again. So DHA, more than a dozen studies now show that reduced level omega-3 fatty acids most effectively diagnosed and recognized by an omega-3 index. The test that you order is an omega-3 index. Most conventional labs like Quest and LabCorp now do it. If you order it through LabCorp, it's called Omega Check. And they, it's a send-out test, which they send to the lab and get an omega-3 index. For those of you who, doc, who can't do it or have a... It's not an expensive test. We even, we even sell a test on our website, a home test for omega-3 index. People can check their omega-3 index. I'm not saying you have to check your index, but, but what I'm saying is more than a dozen studies show that low levels of omega-3 fatty acids increase risk of age-related cognitive decline and dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And here's the study that the Nutritional Research Foundation funded years ago that took 150 vegans and tested their levels, finding 64% were insufficient. And that 64% of insufficiency was very non-generous, very conservative, because we consider them insufficient below four. And really more of the studies today show that six is optimal and below five is insufficient. If we chose five as the number for insufficiency, it might have been 75% of people would have been insufficient. We're very conservative here. And 27% is significantly deficient. That was below three. And that should be maybe below four. So the point is, is that most vegans were, had dangerously low levels, and some had levels of one and, and super low levels. So we thought in that study, maybe these people weren't eating the right or taking the right flax seeds or... Or, so we evaluated that. We evaluated the diets of these 150 people to see was there a relationship between people not eating walnuts, flax seeds, eating too much oils, doing something wrong, and we found that it didn't show any correlation, that even people on the ideal levels of omega-3 intake could have been though, some of those people with the lowest levels. Our conclusion was, and I'm saying our conclusion, I wasn't part of the study, I wasn't one of the researchers in the study, but we funded the study. Our group funded the study for the researchers that did it. They didn't find a relationship between dietary quality or ALA consumption through walnuts and flax seeds and other high sources of um, short-chain omega-3 because there's a, because you convert the short-chain omega-3 from plant foods into the ALA, ALA, alpha linolenic acid, into EPA and then DHA, very small percents. But the conversion enzymes and how well you convert is genetically determined. And your heritage, your genetics, could be that even when you're eating as much ALA as you possibly can and not eating a lot of omega-6 fats, you're still not going to be able to convert well. But some people do convert well. And there are some people who had adequate levels on plant-based diets. So there is some variability there based on genetics. We did give people a small dose of about 150 milligrams of the vegan EPA and DHA and retested their blood tests in three months to see if those people were insufficient, became sufficient with a small dose of supplementation, and that showed to be correct, that a small dose of the supplementation was able to fix the deficiency. 
So you don't have to take a huge dose. So here's a study, a meta-analysis of 17 studies investigating omega-3 levels, and those in the highest fifth, the highest quintile, and that highest quintile was levels above, I think, 5.8, had a 15 to 18% less likely chance of dying over the 15 years of follow-up. So it showed also that lower levels of increased risk of death, all cause of death, both heart attacks and cancer deaths from low levels, because obviously it's not just for the brain, it, it's for the immune system and for the body's resiliency and anti-inflammatory effects. So omega-3 index deficiency increases risk of all causes of death, including cancer death. Here's the omega-3 index in early life death in another study, a separate study corroborating the first study with different researchers showing a five-year loss of life. This study was published in 2021. A recent study just coming out equating smoking risk equaled with low omega-3 index. An average of five years loss of life from low omega-3 index equated to the risk of cigarette smoking. In other words, and they considered the lowest fifth to have levels below 4.2 that we were considering above four to be adequate, and they're saying below four is the lowest risk that had the five-year loss of life equated with cigarette smoking, and the highest was above 6.8. So I used to recommend people be above four, and then I was moved up to saying it's better to recommend people be above five, but probably better above five, but maybe even above six is better. This is from the Framingham Offspring Cohort Study, and just recently published, but more data is corroborating, and I have to say every study coming out shows that it's dangerous to let your omega-3 index get too low, which plant-based eaters all are damaged. And here's some just references, DHA and dementia references, if people want some references from all the studies I was talking about. There's another page of references here, too. Between 150 and 250 is the recommended range. My supplement has about 225 or 250, I think, per, per dose. But that's about 150 of DHA and about 100 of EPA. Usually, if they're trying to look at risk of death, they usually want to start with people above the age of 40. No matter what a person does, if you start with young people in the study, like people that are you know, 15, 20, 25, 30, you can't study them for 20 years, because no matter what they're doing wrong, you're not, going to have a high, you're not going to check who's dying or what the risk of death. In our study, we had all age groups. We were just following levels in the blood. We weren't following um, risk of death. If we wanted to check risk of death, we'd have to start with an older population to be able to track people for 10 or 15 years and have people die and see who dies. But we're talking about people dying, you know, the average American lives to be about 80, so the average smoker lives to be about 74. So if they're saying that people who low DHA had the same risk of early life death as smokers, that meant that they had to track people who were around, they had to track people in the study who were living in their 70s because that's when most people die. Now some herbal cancer fighters, and I'm, we talked about food the whole weekend, but I'm also saying that the fact that we're not using salt on our food and we're not frying things, I mean, you to get flavor, and we're not using all these unhealthy flavorings devices, we, we can use a lot of herbs and the herbs, the basil, the caraway, the cardamom, the cinnamon, the clove, the coriander, the cumin. Oh, they're all seeds, look at that. Dill, ginger, saffron, these things have anti-cancer effects. So the fact that we're making recipes and putting a lot of natural herbs in there, we're actually reducing the risk of cancer further. And my Duca recipe, and my Duca's with 1K on that slide, or probably maybe it is with 1K. This one uses sesame seeds and hazelnuts. Sometimes I use sesame seeds and almonds, and it uses coriander, tarragon, cumin, turmeric, anise, fennel, and paprika. And sometimes I put turmeric in there too to, make, to mix some anti-cancer spices, to just chop with some chopped little lightly toasted nuts so I can sprinkle it on my string beans and my zucchini. Instead of using salt or salt shaker on the table, we have a duca shaker on the table to lose a little flavoring to the vegetables or something that we're eating plain. And of course, we're talking about the anti-cancer pop singers that I recommended already, Simon and Garfunkel, the parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme, that these things are proven to fight cancer. The rosmanic acid from the herb rosemary, also in sage, thyme, and oregano. Potent antioxidants inhibits the growth and spread of metastases of cancer cells. Parsley, moringa, rich in um, apigenin that induces apoptosis in abnormal cells. These natural flavors that add flavors to your food. And of course, you remember parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme are typical spice that you use to put in your soups. It makes the soups taste great. And they have more, and, then, so, and these things work synergistically. So when, when we follow these cooking methods, these recipes, these nutritarian approach, you're literally taking in thousands of different nutrients that work together in a rainbow of, of interactions. 
Whereas on a conventional diet, you're deficient in thousands of nutrients when well, they're just flavoring things with salt and sugar and MSG and frying things and inside, thousands of toxins. And we're using thousands of protective nutrients and maintaining the value of those nutrients, of course. And people wonder why they get cancer. Okay, EGCG, green tea extracts. Green tea extracts have been linked to reduced risk of heart disease, stroke, lung cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, and all-cause mortality. It also slows aging of the brain. So there's some benefit there to this, these compounds and green tea in low dosages. Keep in mind, heavy tea drinkers drinking hot tea all the time increases the risk of throat and oral cancers and tongue cancer because of the hot beverages, because of, not because of the tea, because how hot the beverage is, causing microburns all the time in their mouth. So if you're going to drink tea and you want to have a couple of cups of tea a day, herbal tea or green tea, it's good for you, but make it so it, it cools down a little bit. It's just warm, not super hot. These anti-cancer effects have been attributed to these cotectins that facilitate DNA repair. They inhibit angiogenesis. They do all the things green vegetables do. Let me say that one more time. There's some benefits from green cruciferous vegetables we discussed already, and there are benefits from green tea and green tea extracts that do similar things that complement the effects of the other G-bombs. Saying that one more time in a different way, for example, the study I talked about mushrooms, where women who took an 10 grams of mushrooms a day on the average, 10 grams of mushrooms the size of your thumb, had a 64% low risk of developing breast cancer, but when they took in green tea plus the 10 grams of mushrooms, the risk of breast cancer in that group reduced by more than 89%. Jumped from 64 to 89 when they mixed the two. Or mixing green cruciferous with the mushrooms, we're talking about how by putting the combination of these anti-cancer elements together. That's what a nutritarian diet does. It puts together all these various anti-cancer elements to afford you significant and dramatic protection. Right? Inhibits IGF-1 signaling, prevents UV-induced DNA damage. And you know what protects against UV-induced DNA damage too? The lemonine from the skin of citrus fruits. So that's why I eat kumquats that have this, you eat in the skin, or you would take it, we put a little lemon zest, which is like an organic lemon, and we put a little skin of the lemon in the flavor in the food, and we, those things have anti-cancer effects too. And of course, green tea has anti-estrogenic effects, and of course, turmeric and horseradish and things like that also have anti-cancer effects, we should mention. Dried turmeric, most effective. We can use turmeric fresh. This has anti-proliferative and anti-apoptotic effects, which means that increases the immune system surveillance and recognition of abnormal cells, like mushrooms do also. But the obvious effect you're learning from me is that the more, the more on how you say back up and the more things you have to do the same thing, the more effective the immune system can function. It's never the case that just eating more kale or more strawberries or more portobello mushrooms of one food is going to give you the protection because it's the variety that we find has even the powerful effects, and we're using a variety of anti-cancer substances. And it's what makes the nutritarian approach so valuable when a person has cancer, because we're hitting them with so much variety of anti-cancer substances. We're not just dependent on one thing. We're not just giving them IV vitamin C or ozone. We're not just giving them, we're giving them 100,000 different nutrients to fight cancer. You find them that all improve, that all work better that way. So you can add some to mustard. And of course, mushrooms fight cancer. We've been talking about that all along. But we're also saying that mushrooms fight cancer more to make that point that somebody asked a question about it yesterday. We use a variety of mushrooms. And that's why I recommend for people with cancer, we use a, a, a mushroom extract of dried powdered mushrooms that includes the, um, 10 of the most potent anti-cancer varieties. So people have a wide variety of mushrooms to duplicate what they would have been eating had they lived 100,000 years ago and, for, and foraging for food in the wilderness. They'd be eating many different varieties of mushrooms. So the extra supplements for cancer, my immune biotech contains the astragalus, beta-glucan, and those extra mushroom extracts and the green tea extract and the turmeric, plus these curcumin derivatives that come from turmeric that become more absorbable for people, we utilize these for people who are, who are high risk of cancer or have cancer. And the way I utilize them with the cancer patients too is that green tea extract has such powerful anti-proliferative effects that prevent cells replicating that when a person has cancer, I want to keep the green tea compounds 
circulating in their bloodstream 24 hours a day. I don't want them to take a green tea and then four hours later, they're gonna allow the cell to replicate. So what I do is, I give this supplement, UltraCell Biotech, which I designed it as a base of, from these studies. So instead of having to give people all these different compounds separately, I put it into a supplement. But I designed it so I can have them spread it out through the day so like every five hours they can take another one. So that they can like take it right before they go to bed at night. If they wake up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night or they wake up in the morning at five in the morning, they can take another one. They can take it when they wake up at you know, eight or take it at 12, take it at three, take it at 10. They, so I'm spacing it out so these people with cancer can keep their bloodstream continually bathed in these substances that are gonna interfere with cancer cell replication. So I have a specific protocol that I use with cancer patients, and that's really why I developed these supplements. But because they're so protective, I take one a day of each, but, I, but with a cancer patient, I just take them because they're so good for you, and I'm getting my extra mushroom extracts and green tea extracts. Some people take two a day, but when the person has cancer, I'm really giving them four or five a day. To review this supplements with potential benefits, that I put these kind of dosages in the supplements I'm making too, are D3 between 1,000 and 2,000 a day usually. Most people um, find that 2,000 a day of vitamin D3 is the right dose to keep them in that sweet spot if they're not out in the sun that much. And then zinc, 10 to 20 a day. K2, 25 to 6 to 50 a day. B12, 200 to 500, but usually we give people around, you know, around 100 to 500, I'm saying is okay, or 100. But here's the thing with B12 is the RDI is only five micrograms a day. What am I making people take more than 100 for? Because when you take B12 on a vegan diet, you're taking it in a pill only once a day. Your body can't absorb it all at one time. It only absorbs a little bit at a time. So when you take an extra dose, the intrinsic factor that can only take a little bit in is going to get the same small amount in, maybe one mill microgram in or two micrograms in or one or two, but then you have a, an extra high dose that some of that could come in through direct diffusion to, give you to, the, to get you up to the five or six that you needed for that day. So we're giving people a little higher dose when they're using B12 on a plant-based diet and supplemental instead of eating animal products three times to four times a day. Iodine 150, DHA, you were asking me, 150 to 300. That's DHA plus EPA. That's the DHA added, so it's about 100 of DHA with about 100 of EPA. Our supplement has about 150 of DHA and about 100 of EPA when we take the dropper. And then turmeric, curcumin compounds, usually twice daily, mixed mushroom extracts twice daily, green tea concentrates twice daily, about 300, things like that. So my supplements, I just wrote this down last night for people that are interested. The top three are multivitamins. The prenatal is one that has iron in it. Then the men's multi and women's multi are slightly different. But I also put taurine because taurine is amino acid that's pretty low on a vegan diet and a couple of other things. And then DHA, the immune biotech is the mixed mushroom. The ultracell biotech is the green tea and the turmeric and curcumin um, compounds. And the osteobiotech is for postmenopausal women who are at risk of osteoporosis to give them extra K2 and a, a food-based calcium. Instead of taking calcium pills and all at one shot, which could not be favorable, it's a little bit of calcium, extra food-based they can take with each meal to raise the calcium a little bit with each meal as they're taking a little extra vitamin D and K2 for women who are prone to osteoporosis. So that reviews my supplements. And lastly, a little cartoon I made. Look at it this way. At least we'll be able to stick to Dr. Furman's diet. <laughs> but the joke is good, I think, with a little sailboat shrink fading in the background. But the point is, is that you have to make your house a protective island, right? You've got to go through now, if you're, not, if you're new to this, and get a construction garbage bag and dump everything out of your house and fill your house with only good choices. Like your house is a protective, safe island of safety and you don't have the, like, like, you know what I mean? Don't have like things that are gonna like fuel that's gonna burn up or, the, or poisons the dog can eat and kill himself. You keep your house clean of poisons like bagels and donuts and chips and Fritos and you just get all the crap out of your house. Get the flour, get the salt, get the sugar. You don't have to keep any of that stuff in your house. What do I use salt for? Oh yeah, maybe use salt for cleaning aphids off, off of vegetables a little bit sometimes. Or what do I use anything else in my house?